and your average RVer now looks much different and has different expectations of campgrounds than was the case maybe 10, 20 years ago. Welcome to Requity Insights, a channel dedicated to documenting our journey to 100 world-class communities. Welcome back to Requity Insights. I'm your host, Luis Velez, and I'm joined by my co-host and the CEO of the Requity Group, Dylan Marma. In today's episode, we'll be addressing a question that is becoming increasingly popular among investors. Is it more profitable to build an RV campground from scratch or buying an existing one in today's market? While our previous episodes have focused on the acquisition and operation of existing RV parks and campgrounds, this episode will cover the development of RV campgrounds, including the key steps involved, the pros and cons of building, and the factors to consider before investing in a development deal. So without further ado, let's dive in and explore the world of RV campground development. Dylan, does the Requity Group have any experience with ground up development of RV campgrounds? And is this an area of interest for the group? Well, Lewis, this is definitely a topic that we are becoming increasingly interested in. As of now, we have no direct experience with ground up development for RV campgrounds, though we have worked on some expansion sites to add additional sites to acquisitions that we've had. Up to this date, we've been exclusively an acquisition group. Now, if you look around at the market, what I think is really interesting about developing in the RV campground space right now is that I think that as we've talked about in previous episodes, there's been some real demographic shifts that have taken place and your average RVer is now, now looks much different and has different expectations of campgrounds than, than was the case maybe 10, 20 years ago, right? Even, even less than that. And when you look at the you know, average RVer having the medium household income is over a hundred thousand for, RVers in today's world. And in addition to that, I think as a society, we are probably less interested on average. Of course, some people still love going out in the woods and tent camping and what we would consider to be roughing it. Yeah. Whereas I think now there has been a huge shift towards glamping and having kind of a done for you experience or having the, these next level amenities and a, just a more experience focus or i should say the experience that people are seeking is this shifting right instead of it being seeking just exclusively being out in the woods and you know stepping out of your rv into the dirt now you have more of a demand for amenities of all different you know sorts as we'll we'll touch on so i think when you look at that and you look at where the rv market sits today i actually think there's a segment of the market that is underserved and I think that segment of the market is for RV, more, more of, we call it RV resorts, which have bigger sites, more concrete sites, more amenities, and maybe better Wi-Fi, better infrastructure than a lot of the older campgrounds have. So I'm sure we'll touch more on that, but I think there's a real opportunity there in this segment of the market. For sure. It's definitely being in nature with the comforts of home and some, it seems. Yeah, exactly. Can you explain the criteria used by the Recruity Group when looking for land to develop RV campgrounds? Yeah, so for the purposes of today's show, we want to just really have a high level introduction to development. So let's just talk maybe more about looking at land that is fully entitled, right? And we're looking at land that already has been through the permitting process or the approval process to, to build an RV campground. What's at the point, at the point that we have an entitled piece of land, what are we looking for in that land? In our case, for us, it's really important that the land is large enough. The land must be able to accommodate minimum of 200 sites. The 200 site mark is really where you start to achieve a lot more economies of scale, a lot more efficiencies, a bit, you know, bigger team to be able to manage the day to day on the property. So we really look for at least 200 sites. And when you look at the density requirements, we, we generally try to stay, stay at less than 10 sites per acre. So. If we're targeting minimum of 200 sites, that generally means that for a land to be big enough to consider building an RV campground on, we would want to see at least 25 acres of land yep. to be to meet the size threshold. Yep. 
Now let's talk more about location threshold. With location threshold, we it really depends on who your target audience is. For us, we like to be one having a proximity to some kind of some kind of a draw. There's got to be what we like to call it the wow factor. You got to have some kind of a draw that is bringing people out to this location that's going to get them excited about being repeat guests or buying a seasonal stay at your location depending on if you're long term or short term. This could be beaches, lakes, rivers, could be state parks, amusement parks, zoos, right? I mean there's there's a lot of different draws that will drive people out there but our absolute favorite is always waterfront you can't beat waterfront and we think that if you're on a nice lake or you know if you're on the intercoastal or the ocean you know we feel like that the draw is always there and it will never go away right there's there's a reason our whole our whole country is built around the coast because people are always going to be attracted to water right and Aside from having a natural draw or, or some sort of a man-made draw in that location, our preference is also to be in an MSA of at least 200,000 people. So I know a lot of the industry historically says just build within a two hour drive radius to any big city. And I still think that there's merit to that and people are willing to travel to go out to a campground. But I think as competition increases, we really want to position ourselves in, in a location that is always going to have demand and we don't want to be out on the fringe and have there be an opportunity for developers to come in and build in more superior locations right you'd rather you'd rather pay up a little bit for a good quality piece of land and a good location yeah you want to be the first option you don't want to be the option down the road right yeah, exactly we also prefer public utilities generally we, we do like to have public utilities if available. But that said, especially for a large enough place, we would consider having private utilities. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. Dylan, some owners and developers choose to build campgrounds and resorts under a franchise partnership. So that would be things such as like a KOA, a Margaritaville or a Jellystone. What criteria should someone consider when deciding whether to pursue such a partnership? And what are the benefits and drawbacks of going this route versus creating your own brand? Yeah, so I'm, I'm somewhat indifferent on this subject, so I'll speak towards both what we see as the pros and cons. We've come across developers and fellow acquisition groups that really love the brands and they exclusively focus on either buying branded campgrounds or building branded campgrounds and they love it. And I think the big draw to the brand is it's the idea of having that staple name. It's the reason that when you go into an airport and you have an unbranded coffee house next to a Starbucks, there could be no line at the unbranded place and the Starbucks line is still a 30 minute wait every single time, right? People just have, you know, you know our country has natural gravitation towards familiarity and, and brands. And I think there's always going to be a draw to having that brand. So that said, on the other side of things, you also have some brands some brands don't always have brand consistency, right? So, so some people may be able to go to a branded franchise and in one location that could be very different from one in another location. And, and then it's harder to have that consistency that you might be able to have, right. especially if you're rebranding campgrounds that have been built at all different years and all different locations. It's not always the same as just walking into a Starbucks, which is you know right. a, a box and controls. it's really easy to have it be you know very similar in every single location. So I think that is one argument against a brand. You also will find that with the branded side of things, you know, there is a cost to it. They are taking a percentage of revenue. Okay. So while your marketing should be somewhat more done for you, some operators would argue that they'd rather put that money towards direct marketing and Google, Facebook ads, SEO. And some people both, we've talked to plenty of campers and we've talked to plenty of ownership groups that, that just like kind of more of a boutique hotel, right? They, that's what RVing is about for them. It's about going to unique destinations and having unique experiences. And, and they'd rather not go to a branded location because they're about finding unique spots that they love and, and having kind of being able to appreciate the differences and the different uh, spots that they, they, they seek, right? So yeah. you certainly have pros and cons, but you know, going with a franchise can be really valuable. One, because you have the brand, and then two, I didn't mention as much, but you have kind of that, that council there that has data points. They have teams that can help you with your food and beverage offerings, that can help you with your amenity offerings, your event schedules, right? So you right. kind of get this 
toolkit, you know, call it, or, or a bench of people that it, you know, almost can work with you as like an advisory board and helping throughout the process. So, so I think there's definitely, that's definitely like an ongoing debate on, on which is the, the right way to go. And I think everyone's going to eventually just form their own opinion on, on what's better. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Yeah, absolutely. So when designing an RV campground, what are some important factors to consider in terms of the layout and location of the sites and the amenities? So things like pools, play, playgrounds, bathhouses, like how do you go about that? Yeah, so the layout is extremely important and we've seen certain RV campgrounds or resorts that were developed by multifamily developers, and it's usually very, very easy to spot that, right? If, if this is their first ever RV campgrounds, yeah. they, have, they don't have any RV operations experience, and you see, you know, the, the clear tell giveaway signs are they built, you know, multifamily amenities, right? It's just like a clubhouse, a, which looks like a leasing office, and then, a, and then a gym, a fitness center, and then all the sites might just be back in sites just to maximize the density, and sometimes, They'll cut down all the trees and it just looks like a big kind of templated cookie cutter, you know, cookie cutter layout, right? Yeah, and right. I think that that is usually the tell sign of someone that built a campground that is not coming from the operator background. Right. So I think having the edge of, you know, really either spending time in campgrounds or doing your research or, or having the operations background can be really helpful because you, you're able to make those small differences in the way that you design the layout on the campground, which will make all the difference in the long run and building a place that people love to become repeat you know, loyal customers too. Yeah. I think in terms of modern day camping, what, what most people want to see with the layout, you'll see you know fitness centers are always valuable, but those are actually lower on the list. If you look at the data points of what people vote as their biggest amenities, yeah. it's, it's pretty low. I've seen it last on some lists before. Wow. Whereas you know there, there's generally going to be more value around having water amenity, big pool, lake, some kind of splash pads, having some kind of water features. People love that. Having bark parks can be extremely valuable, either big bark parks or even there's becoming an increasing demand for, we've seen demand for even doggy daycares at big bark parks, which has been really wow. interesting to see. And we've also seen little setups where you get your own individual fenced in area outside of your site. So for dog owners, they can go there and they have a you know yeah. fenced in area that they can let their dog run. A private kennel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, right outside of their campsite. So yeah. there's definitely a draw for that. People, it's always a delicate balance of you want the best Wi-Fi you can possibly get, but you also do want to try to keep trees on the property if there's already trees there because yeah. people like the shade. It keeps their campers cool. It makes it feel more like camping. So having you know somewhat of that natural feel to the land, if, yeah. if possible, goes a long way. While also having good Wi-Fi because that is one of the most sought after things throughout the campground. Having a big event center is extremely important as that's a lot of what is going to be able to help you run a really successful business is having you know great events generally on the weekends you either have live music some kind of food and beverage offerings campground stores things along those lines within your you know event center and your campground store having a a good bathhouse on site is really valuable bathhouse and laundry room where people can step outside their camper and use bigger you know laundry facilities or different bathhouses if you have you know, group stays Having pull-throughs, if you're going to do a lot of short-term stays, pull-throughs can just make the whole experience a little bit smoother on the guests that are coming to visit because they're able to get in and out. And yep. if you have a transient campground, we always recommend having a pretty decent percentage of your sites being built as pull-through sites. Yep. In addition to that, you have buddy sites becoming increasingly popular. And most old campgrounds weren't really built with these because it didn't, wasn't really a thing until more recently, but having buddy sites where you either have, you know, two sites that are facing each other so they can kind of share the fire pit and the, the common areas yeah. in between the RVs. And we've even seen threes and even fours the way the buddy sites are set up so you can get group bookings to be able to book out your, your buddy sites. I think that goes a very long way. And yeah, the list goes on and on, but those are some of the, the early ones that come to mind. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, it's a, it's a wide list of amenities, but yeah, everything seems to be focused about around the recreational aspect of things. Definitely, I could see how without the operations background, you could run into a lot of pitfalls. Without a doubt. Big time. And even just simple things like just making your sites big enough, right? We're seeing a lot of new developments coming in with 40 by 80 sites where, you know, we've seen stuff that's that's 
comfortably half the size or even smaller if that are in older campgrounds. So oh. you just you make some small mistakes like making your your sites too small to meet the modern demand, and you, you shoot yourself in the foot pretty quickly, right? So yeah. so you do want to, density is important, right? Because number of sites is valuable, but mm -hmm. not every site is equal. So you, you really want to focus on the quality of the sites, and that's going to help you kind of get a higher ADR per site, which sure. could could outweigh just having max density. Yep. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Dylan, RV parks can offer a wide range of amenities as we just spoke on. So cabins, facilities, office space, et cetera. How do you determine which amenities to prioritize and how do you balance providing enough amenities to attract your customers while still keeping costs under control? Yeah, so if we boil it down to sort of the, the bare bones amenities, I, I already hit on some, but it's that water feature, it's that event space, having some sort of a campground store that could oftentimes be where people both handle the check-ins to help get registered and find their sites and also be able to buy merch and also having some kind of limited food and beverage I think okay. is really valuable so people yeah. don't have to leave the campground if they need simple food and beverage items. Yeah, that's huge. I think those are essentials. Seems like pickleball is actively becoming an essential. The um, sport. <laughs> and in addition, you, dog parks, very valuable. But then beyond that, you know, really that's where you have to think about the audience that you're, you're catering towards. Yeah. If you're really leaning into more of like high-end resort style where you want people to, you know, it's about the experience, people staying on site the entire time, yeah. you may want to look into having a full-on restaurant. I know for, you know, certain people, certain owners, that, that's an absolute requirement to have a full-blown restaurant service on site. Even if they don't love running restaurants, it, it's more about giving, it's about the amenity aspect of have, people having access to a place where they can sit down and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, and having a food and beverage goes a long way if you have your liquor license as well. The, we've seen some insane numbers on bars at certain campgrounds just in terms of what those are able to achieve and they have great margins as well so we've seen swim up bars do extremely well having if you're catering towards more families more kids you know having putt putt can always be a big hit you know nine hole putt putt course yeah. having water slides on site are always a huge a huge hit and there i mean the list goes on and on but you know i think you, you really have to start with thinking about who your target audience is because if you're going towards more of an older audience maybe you know you're not as focused on the water slides and the putt putt and you know the, the things right. for all ages to do and maybe you're more focused on good food and beverage really nice pool area good events for you know music musicians come out and play and that kind of thing and yeah. if you're focused more for kids you might have more DJs coming out that you know entertain the, the kids and you might have more kid focused amenities so yeah so select the target audience and then kind of reverse work backwards it. from yeah. there yep. yeah it makes sense how do you model the deal based on the sketch plans and amenities package that you choose and then determine if the expected returns warrant putting the land under contract and is there anything in particular to the investor lend that investors or lenders want to see? Yeah, so this, this is where location is everything. And it's so important to be able to have a, a really strong location. Having comps is extremely valuable, though it's not the easiest industry to get really clear cut comps on. Yeah. So I think one, you want to start with markets that you know really well, right? And ideally you've seen P&Ls from other properties within that market or that sort of maybe are in neighboring markets that sort of would compare to, to your property. Yeah. So I would say making sure that, you know, the, 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 like we mentioned, the MSA is big enough and the comp seem to support the income that you're targeting. But modeling the top line, I always say is more of an art than a science. And I think that's the important part is to feel high conviction on the top line income potential of what's achievable and be able to model it in a way where you feel like if things go right, you can blow past those numbers, right? I think you, the, the most important thing is that you're protecting your downside and you have high conviction levels that you're going to be able to hit good return, good quality return that makes it worth the time and the effort by hit, hitting that top line number. Then going into the expense side, that is a little bit easier because if you have ex experienced operating campgrounds, if you don't, you know, if you look at enough operating statements and kind of learn the business model, you can get a better sense on what percentage of your revenue should be getting reinvested back into marketing, what percentage should be getting reinvested into payroll, 
it's fairly easy to be able to calculate what the, the utility costs are going to be at stabilization. Your management fee is going to be usually a fixed percentage of revenue, and then you're, you're going to have your GNA, your landscaping, which you can easily get quotes for. So, yeah. so the expense side of the equation is really not that hard. I mean, it also is not that easy. So I do expect you know you to do a lot of diligence and, and feel feel high conviction about your expense side. But I think for having experience as operators, we that, that seems to be the easier piece of the equation. Yeah. The harder piece is projecting your lease up period in your top line. So we, we generally would anticipate that you have a really heavy marketing budget on the front end. It might be, you know, 18, 24 months till till you're opening the campground or the resort officially, but you want to be pre-marketing early and often yeah. in every using every avenue you can get your hands on. And that could be everything from forming local partnerships throughout the communities with different restaurants or different activities that people can do and kind of cross-promoting, backlinking to your websites, getting SEO out there, being able to start seeding the what, what's to come on all the local development websites and doing some sort of PR on the campground to kind of get the buzz started nice and early, getting people to like your Facebook page well before you even open, getting people to start booking before you even open, doing Google ads, Facebook ads and whatnot, right? I mean, it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars just going into marketing alone yeah. to be able to really create the, the buzz you're looking for, depending on what your strategy is. And, and that could either help you pre-lease if you're doing long-term leases, or it could help you with, you know, just, just getting really high occupancy for the, for the short term. But I think that, you know, that, that, that I think is a, is a huge piece to the income size, making sure you're, you have your, of course, your land costs down, your hard costs, your soft costs, and then also your marketing budgets in a healthy spot, getting ready to really begin to sell the state. Yeah, absolutely. I think touching on what you said, that lease up period, I mean, all this pre-marketing work sounds like it's crucial because, I mean, how much harder is it to walk into something that doesn't have an existing client base, you know, comparative to the acquisition side of the business? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's much harder and it's much harder to predict, right? If you have occupancy reports from previous years, you, you generally know how you're going to do an occupancy, but when you're walking into something that's, that's unheard of, you don't have those repeat guests ready to roll, yeah. you know, signing up, book, booking a year in advance, yeah. right? You, you're, you're looking at a, a fresh audience and you're having to pull them from some of the competition in the area. So yeah. I think that's why you know, marketing is the key yeah. for, for the lease up period. Yeah, absolutely. Dylan, what steps do you take after the LOI and the PSA are executed? Well, it's very deal specific, right? It depends on the stage the, the deal is in, but you know, we're talking now as if the deal is fully entitled just to keep it simple. And you know, in the, in the case that you know, the land already has the proper entitlements, you want to look at the site plan that was used to gain those entitlements and then determine if that's going to be a site plan that you're comfortable building to or if you're going to have to go and get amendments to the site plans and be working with the county to understand what it takes to amend the site plan to be the number of sites and the overall layout that you're you're anticipating yeah. you'll be working closely with all of your engineers getting all of your you know your environment environmental studies done getting all of your surveys completed getting you know all of the you know the nuances to the site plan dialed in best you can yeah. working with different contractors and and subs as needed to get quotes on every aspect of the project inside and out lining up your project manager if you don't already have one lined up and, and and then just you know beginning to think through your strategy and survey the market to understand who who's going to be your target audience and you know then then that's all in, in addition to all of your standard due diligence checklist items that you know you probably could run through in a whole other show so yeah absolutely i know it's really hard to put an exact number on this but what does it generally cost to build a new rv site yeah, so the cost can vary tremendously, and I've heard so many different answers to this, so we'll give high-level info. Uh, the going rate of what we see people list their RV sites for, we're seeing a lot of stuff get listed for 20,000, I'm talking about land cost, right? that's, that's one piece of your equation. We're seeing a lot of people list in that like fifteen to 20,000 per site okay. range. Now, yeah seeing a lot of stuff get listed that doesn't trade there either because everyone seems to think that their place is worth that much but some locations just don't demand it i mean there's some land you give it to us for free and we're still not going to be able to build a profitable rv campground on it because the, the land cost is only one piece of the equation and the income wouldn't be high enough there to justify it so 
So uh, land costs can be all over the board, but kind of that 15 to 20 K per, per entitled site tends to be where I think a lot of the market is trading. Yeah. And it, I think it's worth that. And I think it's an okay price to pay if the location is strong enough and you yeah. have high conviction that you're going to get maybe a hundred dollars a night or more for your, for your short term stays, or, you know, maybe, maybe 7,000 plus a, a year for, for an annual site agreement in that location. Yeah. Then getting into, you have, then you have your, you know, generally your hard costs and your soft costs that will follow. I'll just give kind of what we're seeing for all in costs. We, we've seen anywhere from sort of your mom and pop ownership groups that are out there trenching the land themselves and, you know, laying out the gravel themselves, you know, talking about doing it for, you know, 15, thousand up to twenty thousand per per site yeah. where you know they're doing they're taking a lot more in their own hands there's there's less hiring jobs out so it might take a little bit of a longer time period and maybe doesn't have as high end of an end product in place but you know you've seen some we've seen, definitely seen some low budget developments that get done you know and and that those are just numbers that they've quoted to us so we'd have to probably do our own homework to make sure that that's legitimate and then we've also seen People spending up to you know sixty thousand a site in combined hard and soft costs all in for really high end products. We've seen even a little bit more than that for, for really high end products that have a lot more amenities, a lot more buildings included, and you know everything was done through contractors and subcontractors and whatnot, right? So you have more people in the mix, job. more professionals yeah. in the mix to get uh, you know higher end product developed, but. I think uh, you know land up to twenty thousand, and then being all in anywhere between you know twenty thousand a site to maybe ninety thousand a site is is spread there. kind of the the spread. I know it's a wide gap, but that's just broadly speaking, kind of what we, what we've seen. So yeah. I think you have to look at your market and look at kind of what's possible, and sometimes it's better to phase it too, where you can build at a lower basis early on to kind of test out the, the market and the business plan. And if you see the demands there to start charging higher rates, and yeah. if you if you keep reinvesting, then you can kind of level up to mm. the, the next level for, for the development. Yeah, it makes sense. In that case, would you just make sure you leave the space to be able to add on to the sites? You could either add on to sites. We've seen that, we see that often where they build you know 200 sites, but they have potential to expand to 400 or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. That goes a long way. Or you could do things where you build a you know, an event space, but you don't add the bar and restaurant right away. You just kind of keep the area open and you, you install that once, you, once you've got through the first year or something along those lines, or you leave extra amenity space out for, for people, or you build in a way where you have concrete sites that could be upgraded to more, or gravel sites that could be upgraded to concrete yep. after a you know, certain period of time, or you could always just add more cabins and park models in after a certain period of time. Yeah. That's what I love about this business is that there's so many reinvestment opportunities in campgrounds. So once you find that the location is trending and you're hitting your targets or outperforming your targets, then yeah. you have a lot of options on how you can keep reinvesting back into the place yeah. to kind of keep generating you know, return on the money you're putting back in. Yeah, that's awesome. Before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts or advice for your listeners who are considering building an RV campground from scratch? What would be your top takeaway for them? Yeah, I, I mean, I think spent a lot of time studying the business, understanding the area. I think I, I wouldn't be overly focused on just the cost of the land. I'd be thinking through all of your costs combined and, and kind of making sure that you feel like you have the ability to, to cash flow well. You have the ability to get through your hold period, handle any delays or mm -hmm. you know, stalls that may come up along the way and then and still had it hit a, hit a good quality return after the fact yeah. everyone's going to have a little bit of a different model right i mean i, mean, I know some people that just because we want to build 200 plus sites and we're looking for more like operation operational efficiencies maybe institutional quality exit potential there may be some that you know we we recently spoke with some that wanted to build a you know 30 site campground for themselves because they wanted they want to be more of a owner operator that's functioning as the on-site manager right yeah. whereas we want to hire a, you know a GM for for our communities right so you know you really have to know your, your personal goals are I would definitely lean towards good location trumps everything else that's probably the most the, the, the number one thing you can get wrong is buying the wrong location so making sure your high conviction on your location is I, I think the most important thing. And then, yeah, just being really diligent at each step in the process. So. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Dylan, for sharing all your insights with us today. 
That's all for today's episode. We hope you found the information to be helpful. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to sign up for our email newsletter linked in the notes below. And as always, please like, share, and subscribe. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Requity Insights hosted by our team at the Requity Group. You can find recordings of all shows along with our opt-in form to set up a call and view future investment offerings on our company website, therequitygroup.com, also listed in the show notes.